I'm going to begin by saying that um, The Horse and His Boy is the most autobiographical Narnia book. The Horse and His Boy is very well beloved and often ranked second or third in lists of people's favorite Narnia books. One reason why we find it so easy to identify with the hero, Shasta, is that Lewis himself identified with him. It seems to be the book into which the author, C.S. Lewis, put the most of himself. Lewis poured much of his imaginative self-understanding into Shasta. Shasta and his situation, his exile, his orphanhood, his travails, and his journey of self-discovery seem to be a projection of Lewis's own understanding of his life. Shasta escapes from servitude to a land he has never been before and finds that he has arrived at his childhood home. So The Horse and His Boy is a philosophical adventure novel which dramatizes the notion of the soul as exiled from a lost Edenic home. And this is many echoes with how C.S. Lewis explained his life story in his autobiographical Surprised by Joy. Joy is not an everyday word in Lewis's vocabulary. It means for him the experience of the most deep and blissful desire and longing. In Surprised by Joy, Lewis says that when he first read the mystical fairy tales of the Scottish writer George MacDonald, he was overwhelmed with joy and underwent the baptism of my imagination. George MacDonald himself once said that the reason why people fantasize about being the long lost children of royalty is that this is what we really are. We really have a king for our father and our daily life here below is a kind of exile from our true sonship of that royal father. From very near the start of the horse and his boy, from the moment we are told that the young Shasta called him father, the reader knows that the fisherman Ashish is not Shasta's real father. And when Shasta himself learns this by eavesdropping on the conversation of Ashish and a Kalamine lord, his first thought is one of mingled relief and highfalutin fantasy. Why? I might be anyone, he thought. I might be the son of a Tarkan myself, or the son of the Tisrock, may he live forever, or of a god. It's a, it's a very George MacDonald sort of thought. And MacDonald, and certainly Lewis himself, would say that the Calamine belief that their great lords and their sovereign, the Tisrock, may he live forever, are descended from the god Tash, <laughs> is a kind of muddled and blotted appreciation of the truth, that all human beings are children of the gods. So at the end of The Horse and His Boy, when Chester is recognized and welcomed with open arms by King Loon, it is a kind of return of the prodigal son, a homecoming to the true and authentic father. But I don't only mean that the novel is autobiographical in terms of some weird Scottish Neoplatonic theory about the hidden immortality of the soul and its return to bliss. After Shasta discovers he is really Prince Cor, son of King Loon, he tells Aravis, his erstwhile traveling companion and fellow fugitive, father wants you to come and live with us. He says there's been no lady in the court since mother died. Do, Aravis. C.S. Lewis describes his childhood loss of his mother to cancer in Surprised by Jury. It's hard not to imagine that the king and queen of Archenland are his own parents, perfected and made tolerable. King Loon is his own father, rendered likable, and with all the sting of the two men's incompatibility taken out. The horse and his boy is the only Nana ear story with no visitors from other dimensions. This makes it what young people call intense meaning very focused on a single action. Lewis does not want any pesky Pevensies butting in and stealing the limelight in his mythologized autobiography. The single action of the novel is the escape of Shasta, Aravis, and the two horses from Calamon, the fallen world, into the upper world of Archenland. The action is entirely focused in this single, in this single event of flight, 
much like the action of some of John Buchan's thrillers, is focused on flight through English towns and Scottish moors. The 39 Steps is called a man-on-the-run thriller, and I believe Lewis admired it. Lewis's two horses and two humans on the run thriller dramatizes the return of the human soul to the far country once it originated. It's a wish fulfillment in the sense that once the protagonists get to Arkenland, the struggle of daily life is behind them. The two dimensions of this novel are Kalamin and Narnia, and it's about escape from one to the other. It would confuse the issue to introduce any other region. We are all careful to despise wish fulfillment fantasy, especially one that explicitly involves marrying a mother substitute. But much of the secret of the delight of C.S. Lewis's Narnia and much of the attraction of his other books is that he puts the natural human desire for a supernatural world into words and action, into a story. The Narnia books baptize our imagination because they express the Christian story as the fulfillment of our deepest human desire and longing. Part of the theory of all that is in Lewis's first storybook, the nearly unreadable Pilgrim's Regress. From Pilgrim's Regress onwards, for Lewis, the natural desire is a pilgrimage or a journey. And I'll come back to that later, but first I will remind you of the story of the horse and his boy. The story begins in the country of Kalaman, in the country, in the cottage of a fisherman named Ashish. Shashta toils for Ashish by day and night. The narrator sketches a lonely and harsh childhood for Shasta. When he has a quiet moment by himself, Shasta daydreams about whatever may lie to the north of their rough dam. The narrator tells us that Shasta was not at all interested in anything that lay south of his home because he had once or twice been to the village with Ashish and he knew that there was nothing very interesting there. But he was very interested in everything that lay to the north because no one ever went that way, and he was never allowed to go there himself. When he was sitting out of doors, mending the nets, and all alone, he would often look eagerly to the north. One could see nothing but a grassy slope running up to a level ridge, and beyond that the sky, with perhaps a few birds in it. If Ashish was around, Shasta would ask him what lay beyond the hill. When Ashish was in a bad mood, he would reply by boxing Shasta's ears. If he was a bit more cheerful, Ashish would tell him it was a useless and impractical question. Shasta thought that beyond the hill, there must be some delightful secret which his father wished to hide from him. In reality, however, the fisherman talked like this because he didn't know what lay to the north. Neither did he care. He had a very practical mind. One night, a Kalamin lord, or Tarkan, arrives by horse. Soon he is bartering with Ashish for the boy. His so-called father has no qualms about selling Shasta into real slavery. The Tarkin's horse startles Shasta by proposing that they run away together. This is a Narnian talking horse who has been kidnapped and spent his adult life as a slave to the humans. The two fellow slaves conspire to create their own horse-powered underground railway. They plot to flee to the north because believing that his charger is a witless calamine beast, the Tarkin will conjecture they went south. They go north because Bree wants to return home to Narnia. Oh, hurrah, said Shasta, then we'll go north. I've been longing to go north all my life. Of course you have, said the horse. That's because of the blood that's in you. I'm sure you're true northern stock. The tale of the nocturnal escape, with Shasta's many painful falls from his perch atop Bree, is realistic. Reading it in my boarding school at the age of 10 or 11, it would never have occurred to me that it is about the journey of the soul to God. It is much too exciting for that. <laughs> After some night's travel, Shasta and his equine companion are terrified to find themselves being hotly pursued by a lion. They are driven into the company of another rider, apparently fleeing from a second horse. They gallop knee to knee. Indeed, Bree said afterward that a finer race had never been seen in Calamon. Oops, so we've got this all mixed up. Here we are. Here we are. 
After the foursome make their escape, the fine-bred mare turns out to be another kidnapped slave from Narnia, and her rider, a young girl, Aravis, disguised in her brother's armor, and escaping betrothal to an elderly, humpbacked, ape-faced grand vizier. The four decide that they will be less conspicuous if they throw in their lot and travel together. As they approach the capital of, of Kalaman, Tashban, the foursome decide that if they are separated, they will meet at the tombs. Like many an ancient Mediterranean and or Oriental city, Tashban buries its dead outside the city walls. Like all sensible ancient people, Shasta and his companions find the tombs terrifying. As they make their way through the city, they are indeed separated. Shasta is mistaken for Prince Corin of Arkenland and taken home by a group of Narnian courtiers. The unintentional spy overhears that Queen Susan has been in Tashban, flirting with marriage to the oldest son of the sovereign Tizarak, Prince Rabadash. She has decided to reject Prince Rabadash's hand, and fearing that Rabadash will take her by force, the Narnian party decide to slip back to Narnia by night in their ship. Meanwhile, Ar Aravis has had her own adventure. Once recognized by a childhood friend, she attempts to get to the tombs through the Tisrox palace, and likewise becoming an involuntary spy, overhears Prince Rabadash's plan to seize the fugitive Queen Susan by taking a party of 200 horsemen and invading Narnia through Arkenland. Once the foursome meet up again at the tombs, they race through the desert to Arkenland to warn of the oncoming invasion. Exhausted by their trip through the desert, the four only squeak through in time to give the warning after yet another lion chases and pursues them into the mountainous pass. Shasta gives the warning, battle is raised, the Calamines are defeated, Prince Rabadash is turned into a donkey, King Loon recognizes that Shasta is a long lost twin brother of Prince Corin, an heir to the throne of Arkenland, and all of them live happily ever after. Even the two horses, Bree and Huynh, get married, though not to one another. That's the map of their journey. Um, so my next point is animal companionship. Of all the Narnia books, The Horse and His Boy is one that perhaps most benefits from being read first in childhood. A child will not see any allegory in it. What he will first delight in is the tale of animal companionship. The novel is the one in the series most focused on the Narnian animals as animals. This is an important moral concern of Lewis. The novel was written at a time when many real life stories brought to our attention crossover tales of animal-human friendship. They are crossover tales because they tell of empathy and understanding between animals and human beings. Two of the most well-known from around the same sort of time The Horse and the Boy was written are Born Free, about Elsa the Lioness, and Taka the Otter, about Taka the Otter. Of course, the talking beasts feature in all the Narnia books. But in the other books, they compete much more with fawns and dragons and dwarfs and so on. In this book, the horses are the protagonists and near the moral center of the book. They're not just comedic characters, they are real horses. On his painful journey to freedom in the north, Shasta learns to ride from Bree. And in spite of his rude words, Bree was a patient teacher. No one can teach riding so well as a horse. The tale of animal-human companionship is so attractive that few children will register much that Brie is a walking lesson in pride and its reward. I always think it's worth pointing out how appealing Lewis's talking animals are in our culture. I do so because I spent many decades amongst good Christian folk who thought the greatest danger for humanity today is Gaia worship. And yet we can see that Lewis, with his witty anthropomorphic animals, wrote the most appealing apologetics of the past century. Lewis's Irish love of dogs and horses and badgers is a real win for Christianity. It is something entirely lost on the much poorer, more rural Mediterranean world, which still sees animals in a far more utilitarian way, rationalized with Catholic teaching about who has a soul and who does not. Here, I think the Anglican Lewis has got it right. 
I go now to my fourth point, a bit of allegorical moralizing. The four sum of horses and humans is not constructed simply to exhibit the delights of human on animal friendship. The two pairs neatly il illustrate the contrast of pride and humility. Quinn and Shasta are humble creatures, while Aravis and Bree are proud. As Lewis describes the initial relations of the four, Quinn the mare was rather shy before a great war horse like Bree and said very little. And Aravis never spoke to Shasta at all, as she could help it. It is Quinn who proposes a tactic for crossing Tashban undetected. The horses must be muddied and cut about and pretend to be pack animals. The charger cares all too much about what others think and strongly objects to this proposed kenosis. My dear madam, said Bree, have you pictured to yourself how very disagreeable it would be to arrive in Narnia in that condition? Well, said Quinn humbly, she was a very sensible horse, the main thing is to get there. <laughs> Quinn is really, in a sense, the female counterpart of Shasta, though I hesitate to call her the heroine of the book. The character Lewin, Quinn most reminds us of is perhaps Lucy, and especially the Lucy of Prince Caspian. When she is weak, she is strong. After the hot and dry trot across the desert, with Rabbit Ash's army at their heels, it is Quinn who tries to insist that the horses must not resist, must not rest, but must speed on ever faster. Please, said Quinn very shyly. I feel just like Bree that I can't go on. But when horses have humans with spurs on their back, aren't they often made to go on when they're feeling like this? And then they find they can. I mean, I mean couldn't we be able to do even more now that we're free? It's all for Narnia. I think, ma'am, said Bree very crushingly, that I know a little more about campaigns and forced marshes and what a horse can do than you do. To this, Quinn had no answer, being like most highly bred mares, a very nervous and gentle person who was easily put down. In reality, she was quite right, and if Bree had had a tarkin on his back to make him go on, he would have found that he was good for several hours hard going. But one of the worst results of being a slave and being forced to do things is that when there is no one to force you anymore, you find you have almost lost the power of forcing yourself. Kellerman itself, the land of kidnappies and enslavement, is constructed out of pride and self-sufficiency. Despite his Narnian blood, Kalamine attitudes have rubbed off on Bree. Bree must be doubly humbled before he can enter Narnia, a free horse, once again. First, he must see that it is Shasta, the little ill-bred fisherman's boy, who leaps down out of the saddle and goes back to rescue Aravis from the lion who pursues them into Arkenland. He must learn before he can return to his native country to lose his self-conceit. I'm not so keen on the second lesson which Bree learns. Few of you will know the British tradition of pantomime. These are Christmas plays, usually performing tales like Cinderella, supposedly for children, but, as my parents used to remark sarcastically, heavily laced with filthy double entendres uh, intended for the adults who were forced to accompany their children to these plays. <laughs> the scene in which Bree is taught not to demythologize Aslan, King of the Beasts, seems to me like a Christian version of pantomime humor. For no reason I can connect with anything else in the book, Lewis launches into an attack on Rudolf Bultmann, John Robinson, and the then fashionable process of demythologizing scriptural imagery. He has poor Bree insisting that Aslan's leaning qualities are metaphorical, while Aslan the lion perches on a ledge behind him. Then the lion approaches. Now, Bree, he said, you poor, proud, frightened horse, draw near. Nearer still, my son. Do not dare not to dare. Touch me, smell me. Here are my paws, here is my tail. These are my whiskers. I am a true beast. It would be very funny, especially if you have known the type of stuck-up Anglican modernist that Lewis is satirizing. But why stick it in here? Why morph Bree the war horse into an Anglican modernist? <laughs> At a pinch, one can see how refusing the real lionine physicality of Aslan reflects pride and arrogance, but the scene does not connect much to anything else in the story. 
war horses and soldiers are not obviously given to excessively philosophical speculative conceptions of the scripture. None of the Calamines demythologize the god Tash. So it's hard to see how this comes about. The theme of pride versus humility is the moral counterpart of, of the overall story theme of Narnia versus Calamine. And through the four characters, we are shown that the border between good and evil runs through every heart. Even the proud Aravis, who does not care that her slave gets a whipping if she can execute her escape from the Grand Vizier, is said to be true as steel and would never have deserted a companion whether she liked him or not. The character who is most profoundly mocked for his pride in the book is, of course, Prince Rabadash. The penalty is imposed on him by Aslan himself. Rabadash is turned into a donkey and told that the only way to reverse the metamorphosis is to appear before the high altar of the god Tash in this donkified state. I always think that one of the advantages of C.S. Lewis over the deadly earnest writer like Tolkien is that Lewis loved the whole comic tradition of English literature from Chaucer through Austen and Dickens. Prince Rabadash is simple, but he is in that great tradition of stock comic buffoons. Through him, Lewis manages to show that pride is fear-inspiring, but also ridiculous. The Horse and His Boy is a comic novel, and therefore, none of its characters is utterly lost. Prince Rabadash survives his ordeal to become Rabadash the Ridiculous. I turn to my fifth point. Who are the Calamines? Lewis's picture of the Calamines is colored by the Englishmen of his generation's dislike of abroad. I once twitted my father, a Londoner, that for his generation, civilization ended at Calais. You mean East Croydon, he answered vigorously and with feeling. A great deal of the Calamines, their all-purpose southernness, could reflect anywhere in the south of Europe from Spain, Portugal, Mediterranean, France, and Italy. Aside from the frogs, whops, and dagos, the thing which true insular Englishmen most dislike about abroad is the food. There was no real bread, no proper breakfast, only croissants, and the meat was mucked about with oily sauces. <laughs> I can remember when olive oil was exotic and somewhat pretentious in England. In the early 1960s, cooking with olive oil was a mark of bohemian pretentiousness. So I always laugh at the lines when Shasta first eats butter amongst the Narnian dwarfs. It was all new and wonderful to Shasta, for calamine food is quite different. He didn't even know what the slices of brown stuff were, for he had never seen toast before. He didn't know what the yellow soft thing they smeared on the toast was, because in calamine you always get oil instead of butter. <laughs> Lewis had no taste for Johnny Farner, but it gets worse, of course. Great rivers of ink have been spilt defending and accusing Lewis of making Muslims of his Calamines. The Calamines are and must be somewhat Arabic or Oriental. Lewis mentions several times, in Surprise by Joy, that he read Herodotus' histories as a schoolboy. Herodotus describes in his history the two attempted Persian invasions of Greece, first by Darius the Great, great in 490 BC, and then, you know, the ancient Greeks counted backwards. Uh, the second Persian war by Darius' his son, Xerxes, in 480 BC. Thessaly is the mountains, and that's what initially held the Persians back. Xerxes led his men through a narrow mountain pass, whose existence was given away to the invaders by a shepherd. Then, as we know, he was able to double back on the 300 Spartans holding the gateway to Greece at Thermopylae. If one could have died at the hot date, Gates with the 300 instead of being a theology professor. <laughs> On both occasions, the Persian invaders were repelled by the Greek city-states, who won heroic victories at Marathon, Plataea, and Mycar. Herodotus is an objective but not an unbiased reporter. Throughout his depiction of the Persian wars, he describes the Persians as slaves, fighting under the yoke of the tyrants, Darius and Xerxes. And conversely, he describes the Greeks as free men. He leaves the reader in no doubt that these battles were fought and won by the gods and goddesses of Greece, of course, but also by the free city-states, above all the democratic city-state of Athens. 
It is difficult not to think that this moral geography is the original lever for Lois's moral imagination in his juxtaposition of Calamine and Archenland, or Thessaly, and Narnia, Greece proper. Herodotus's histories were not, in those days, esoteric knowledge. Lewis would have expected English schoolboys among his readers to know chunks of them as Greek unseen. But, of course, it is anachronistic to say the Calamines are pre-Christian Persians and leave it at that. English men of Lewis's time were divided between the perhaps more imperialist type, like Kipling, who admired India and its Muslim population, and those like Chesterton and John Buchan, who regarded Muslims as a threat to European civilization. Lewis was more a little English Chestertonian than an imperialist. I don't think Lewis ever cites Kipling approvingly. The modern literature Lewis read, such as Buchan and Chesterton, is replete with Islamic stereotypes. When Chesterton was not rambling about cosmopolitan Jewish bankers, he was ranting about Muslims with their iron-willed fatalistic deity. Even if he has the face of a Hindu deity, Lewis's Tash, the inexorable, the irresistible, owes a good deal to Chesterton's conception of the Islamic God to whom human beings can do nothing other than bow and submit. It is no good denying that Shasta's father, foster father, Ashish, and the Calamine Tark, and the Kalamin Tarkin, who barter for him, are anything other than Arabs out of 19th century English fantasy. What they're doing is bartering for Shasta Sol and selling or buying him into slavery. They're slavers. The Kalamins make their first appearance on stage in the Narnia series in the voyage of Don Treader as merchants purchasing slaves from pirates. They have lost their money after a rough batch of Pevensies and talking mice were freed by Prince Caspian. They wear flowing robes and orange-coloured turbans, and they are a wise, wealthy, courteous, cruel, and ancient people, it says in the voyage of the Dawn Treader. They speak in long and polite proverbs, but these merchants want their money back for the slaves freed from the auction block. The Calamines are not, in Lewis's imagination, simply a slave-owning people. Slavery is not simply a peculiar institution in Calamian society. All of them are slaves through and through, from the Grand Vizier down to the merest peasant who must jump out of the way of cutting whips as he navigates the Tashban traffic. After inadvertently eavesdropping on her betrothed's conversation, Aravis describes the Grand Vizier as a hideous, groveling slave who flatters when he's kicked. When Shasta likewise inadvertently spies on the Narnian plans to give Prince Rabadash the slip, Shasta thinks, I simply daren't tell them I'm not Prince Corin now. I've heard all their plans. If they knew I wasn't one of themselves, they'd never let me come out of this house alive. They'd be afraid I'd betray them to the Tithrock. They'd kill me. And if the real Corin turns up, it'll come out, and they will. He had, you see, no idea how noble and freeborn people behave. There are a few digs at Calamine voluntarist theology, but the point of the contrast of the Narnians and the Calamines is sociological, anthropological, and moral. It is to contrast a free society with a society of slaves. Calamine society is one in which everyone values their own autonomy and seeks to achieve power over everyone else, and which everyone, right up to the Tisrock, is a slave. So, my next point, from slavery to freedom. I always encourage students to get the meaning of a book from the title. It doesn't always work to rip the essence of a book from the title when the book is translated from German. <laughs> but more often than not, the author distills his idea into five or six words at the front, and one can judge a book by that part of the cover. The horse of the title does not belong to Brie and is not the boy's horse, because he is a free Narnian horse. He does not exist for human use and exploitation. This idea makes complete intuitive sense to a child. Narnia symbolizes freedom, because the talking animals are their own people. The talking animals are free persons. This is spelled out several times by the horses themselves. When Aravis asks Bree and Shasta why they keep talking to her horse instead of to her, even her gentle mare objects. 
Excuse me, Tarquina, said Bree, with just a slight backward tilt of her ears. But that's calamine talk. Uh, sorry, his ears. That's calamine talk. We're free Narnians, Hwin and I. And I suppose if you're running away to Narnia, you will be one too. In that case, Hwin isn't your horse any longer. One might just as well say you're her human. The idea that even in our own world, the four-legged animals do not exist to be instrumentalized and exploited by human beings mattered a great deal to C.S. Lewis. It is a significant part of the third volume of his space trilogy, The Hideous Strength, where evil scientists kidnap animals to experiment on them. In The Horse and His Boy, Lewis is uses the same idea to represent the contrast of a society of free persons and a slave society. Bree is not going to pretend that the Tisroc could or should live forever. Why, asked the horse, I'm a free Narnian. And why should I talk slave and fool's talk? I don't want him to live forever, and I know that he's not going to live forever whether I want him to or not. And I can see you're from the free north too. No more of this southern jargon between you and me. Above all, above and beyond representing a slave society, calamine represents captivity. The point of it is not just moral, but downright theological. Deciding that it's okay and not even stealing to take food from the calamine villages, Bree observes, a free horse and a talking horse mustn't steal, of course, but I think it's all right. We're prisoners and captives in enemy country. That money is booty, a spoil. Besides, how are we to get any food for you without it? Lewis wants to suggest that all of us here on earth outside of Christ are prisoners and captives to the devil. Human nature, fallen from its original paradise, is in a condition of slavery and lives in an infernal region of captivity. <coughs> so here I return to the autobiographical quality of the horse and his boy. I return to my opening parry. None of the Pevensies, nor Jill, nor even Eustace Shrub is C.S. Lewis in the way that Shasta is. The unmannered boy from the fisherman's cottage who sulks in the face of Aravis' well-bred refinements is the adult Lewis who always felt a bumbler and an alien in this world. The journey from Calamon to Narnia is a spiritual journey which Lewis undertook from his prosaic childhood in Belfast to the joy of Christianity. I'm quite sure that this analogue was present in Lewis's mind when he wrote the book. When Huynh meets the emperor of the beasts in the hermit's garden in Archenland, Aslan says, Dearest daughter, I know you would not be long in coming to me. Joy shall be yours. To exhibit this point about the confessional character of the horse and his boy, I want to reflect on some passages from Surprised by Joy. The first contrasts the prosaic character of his parents' literary tastes as compared to his own, just as Arshishish's lack of interest in the beyond is contrasted with Shasta's dreams about what lies to the north. My mother was a voracious reader of good novels, and I think the Merediths and Tolstoys which I have inherited were brought for her. My father was fond of oratory and had himself spoken on political platforms in England as a young man. If he had had independent means, he would certainly have aimed at a political career. In this, he might well have succeeded if he had many of the gifts once needed by parliamentarians, a fine presence, a resonant voice, great quickness of mind, eloquence, and memory. Trollope's political novels were very dear to him. In following the career of Phineas Finn, he was vicariously gratifying his own desires. He was fond of poetry, provided it had elements of rhetoric or pathos. He greatly enjoyed all humorous authors from Dickens to W. W. Jacobs and was himself almost without rival the best raconteur I have ever heard. The best of the type that acts all the characters in turn with a free use of grimace, gesture and pantomime. What neither he nor my mother had the least taste for was that kind of literature to which my allegiance was given the moment I could choose books for myself. Neither had ever listened for the horns of Elfland. There was no copy of Keats or Shelley in the house. If I am a romantic, my parents bear no responsibility for it. <laughs> Tennyson my father liked, but it was the Tennyson of In Memoriam and Loxley Hall. I never heard of the Lotus Eaters or the Mort de Arthur. My mother cared for no poetry at all. Whether or not Lewis intends to disparage his parents, they gave him a great deal. 
he would have been a novelist like George MacDonald, who is seldom today read for pleasure, if he had not inherited his father's skills as a raconteur and the ability to do the character and their voices. The great tradition of the English comic novel flows into and irrigates the Narnia books, raising them above the deadly, humorless, post-Raphaelite post Norse kitsch of Middle Earth. <laughs> My next quotation <laughs> almost immediately follows on from there. We see that Lewis learned to contrast the two worlds from his working class nurse, and that Kalaman is probably not Persia, but in inverted commas, India. In addition to good parents, good food, and a garden, I began life with two other blessings. One was our nurse, Lizzie, in whom even the exacting memory of childhood can discover no flaw, nothing but kindness, gaiety, and good sense. Through Lizzie, we stuck our roots into the peasantry of County Down. We were thus free of two very different social worlds. To this, I owe my lifelong immunity from the false identification of refinement and virtue. From before I can remember, I had understood that certain jokes could be shared with Lizzie that were impossible in the drawing room, and also that Lizzie was, as nearly as any human can be, simply good. The other blessing was my brother. We were very different. Our earliest pictures reveal it. His were of ships and trains and battles. Mine were of what were called dressed animals, the anthropomorphized beasts of nursery literature. His earliest story was called The Young Raja. He had already made India his country. Animal land was mine. But nowhere, either in my brother's work or my own, is there a single line drawn in obedience to an idea of beauty. This absence of beauty is characteristic of our childhood. No picture on the walls of our father's house ever attracted our attention. We never saw a beautiful building nor imagined that a building could be beautiful. My earliest aesthetic experiences were already incurably romantic. Once in those very early days, my brother brought into the nursery the lid of a biscuit tin, which had covered with moss and garnished with twigs and flowers, so as to make it a toy garden or a toy forest. This was the first beauty I ever knew. I do not think the impression was very important at the moment, but it soon became important in memory. As long as I live, my imagination of paradise will retain something of my brother's toy garden. And every day there are what we call the green hills, the low line of the Castlereagh Hills, which we saw from the nursery windows. They were not very far off, but they were to children quite unattainable. They taught me longing, science made me for good or ill, and before I was six years old, a votary of the blue flower. When Lewis says he was a votary of the blue flower, that means that he longed for what seems unattainable. He was addicted to what he also calls unconsolable longing. Lewis was, by his Ulster origins and lifelong Anglicanism preserved from the attentions of the Holy Office. But he is speaking of what the Jesuits of his own generation called the natural desire for the supernatural vision. Along with those luminaries, he realized from his own experience that the people of his time who had lived through the Great War would not return to faith through moral exhortation, but only through rediscovering that their hearts were restless and joyless until they found enjoyment and rest in God. Just like Shasta, Lewis can see the hills from the window of his house, and as with the fisherman's adopted son, the sight of the hills taught him to long for and desire joy. His desire for joy is not expressed in his childhood stories about animal land. Lewis's animal land is not a childhood version of Narnia. It was, he says a bit further on, utterly prosaic, and had nothing in common with Narnia except the anthropomorphic beasts. Animal land, Lewis says, excluded the least hint of wonder. Lewis's glimpses of joy taught him to fill animal land with wonder and mystery when he wrote the Narnia books. They taught him to plant Narnia to the north. So I turn to my next one. That's animal land, and you can see that's, that's his childhood picture of animal land in India, and you can see it's to the north of India even then. So I turn to my eighth point, Narnia and the north. The persistent refrain of the horse and his boy is now for Narnia and the north. <laughs> I was going to try and nay. And the reason is autobiographical. Lewis came to associate joy with northernness. 
through his discovery of North mythology and of Wagner. He says that Wagner would lead him to all of North mythology. Lewis comes to give northernness a definite article. The northernness is a desire for it and imply the absence of its object. Whenever he mentions it, Lewis speaks of cold northern skies. I had become fond of Longfellow's saga of King Olaf. But there came a moment when I idly turned the pages and found the unrhymed translation of Tegna's Draper and read, I heard a voice that cried, Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead. I knew nothing about Balder, but instantly I was uplifted into the huge regions of northern sky. I desired with almost sickening intensity something never to be described, except that it is cold, spacious, severe, pale, and remote, and then found myself at the very same moment already falling out of that desire and wishing I was back in it. Lewis is about eight years old when he first discovers Balder. Then there are five or more years of one-dimensional flat boarding school experience until this long winter broke up in a single moment. The sky had turned round. What I had read was the word Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods. What I had seen was one of, King, one of Arthur Rackham's illustrations to that volume. I had never heard of Wagner nor of Siegfried. I thought the Twilight of the Gods was the twilight in which the gods lived. Pure northernness engulfed me, a vision of huge clear spaces hanging over the Atlantic in the endless twilight of northern summer, remoteness, severity. And almost at the same moment, I knew that I had met this long, long ago in Tegna's Draper, that Siegfried belonged to the same world as Balder and the sunward sailing cranes. And with that plunge back into my own past, there arose at once, almost like heartbreak, the memory of joy itself, the knowledge that I had once had, what I now lacked for years, that I was returning at last from exile and desert lands to my own country. And the distance of the twilight gods and the distance of my own past joy, both unattainable, flowed together into a single unendurable sense of desire and loss, which suddenly became one with the loss of the whole experience which had already vanished. These lines seem to contain the key to the horse and his boy and also to all of Lewis's apologetics. I was returning at last from exile and desert lands to my own country. This is the heart of the novel and of Lewis's conception of Christianity. He had as yet to hear a single note of Wagner. Next holidays, in the dark crowded shop of T. Ed Eden's Osborne, I first heard a record of the ride of the Valkyries. To a boy already crazed with the northerners, whose highest music experience had been Sullivan, the ride came like a thunderbolt. We must be clear that for Lewis, the imaginative and literary joy, which is induced by ascetic experience, is not one and the same thing as a beatific vision. It is just a foretaste of it. It is God's tackle and lure, God's not very subtle clickbait. The pursuit of joy is what leads Lewis unknowingly toward heaven and true freedom. Lewis writes that, on my cousin's dressing table, I found the very book which started the whole affair, Siegfried and the Twilight of the Gods, illustrated by Arthur Rackham. His pictures, which seemed to me then to be the very music made visible, plunged me deeper into my delight. I got it in the end because my brother went shares with me purely through kindness, that he was not enslaved by northern, northernness. You can still be a slave to joy, and the pursuit of joy can become idolatrous, because the joyous vision of Arthur Rackham's illustrations is only an image of the vision of God. But Lewis continues, At that time, Asgard and the Valkyries seemed to me incomparably more important than anything else in my experience. They seem much more important than my steadily growing doubts about Christianity. This may have been penal blindness, yet that might not be the whole story. If the northerners seemed then a bigger thing than my religion, that may have been because my attitude toward it contained elements which my religion ought to have contained and did not. It was not itself a new religion, for it contained no trace of belief and imposed no duties. 
Yet there was in it something very like adoration, some kind of disinterested self-abandonment to an object, which claimed this by being the object it was. We are taught in the prayer book to give thanks to God for his great glory, as if we owed him more thanks for being what he is than for any benefit he confers upon us. And so indeed we do, and to know God is to know this. But I had been far from any such experience. I came nearer to feeling this about the North gods in whom I disbelieved than I had ever done about the true God while I believed. Sometimes I can almost think that I was sent back to the false gods there to acquire some capacity for worship against the day when the true God should recall me to himself. So, finally, the path of divine providence runs north. The horse and his boy is not about a boy who is lured by his longing for liberty and romance to the free and romantic north. Like the supernatural desire, the northernness is a call, a calling and a vocation. Shasta does not jump for the north when he runs away with Bree. He is pushed. All through the story we learn, he has been pushed and propelled north by Aslan himself. When Shasta encounters a shadowy, massive presence in the dark forest and tells that strange presence his sob story, he does not meet with immediate sympathy. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions, asked Shasta. There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I just told you there were two on the first night and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gasped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Aravis, and I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave, you, gave the horses a new strength of fear while the last mile so that you could reach King Loon in time. And I was... Lost my last page. Ooh, lost page. And I, I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death. And I was the lion you do not remember the who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it come to shore where man sat, wakeful at night, to receive you. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook. Myself, loud and clear and gay. And then the third time, myself, whispered so softly you could hardly hear it, and yet it seemed to come from all around as if the leaves rustled with it. Aslan could equally say, I was the inconsolable longing. I was your desire to escape. I am the way north. Thank you. <laughs>